Hey, everybody. Welcome to Plate Mark, Series 2, The History of Western Printmaking. My name is Anne Schaefer, and I'm your host. This episode is covering relief printmaking. Uh, True and I went on and on and on about materials and techniques, and um, it ended up being two plus hours, so I've decided to split it up. This one will cover the... um, the fine art of relief printmaking, woodcuts, linoleum cuts, reduction woodcuts, things like that. So uh, strap in and enjoy. All right, welcome back. We are turning our minds to techniques now, and our plan is to review for you in a pretty overview kind of way the major techniques in printmaking and I feel like, I mean, there's so much to it. There's, there are things we will not say. And if you're super curious, you know, get in touch. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll correspond. And there's a cat in the room. Oh, there is a cat. Hi, Bitey Jean. She means well. And she loves Anne. She does. There, there, there are several different ways that prints are made. And, and it's also interesting to think about how they, um, they, each of them is the new technology of the day. Um, if you think about how they are the website of their time, I mean, because it's visual communication. So if you think about, for instance, the oldest one is, yeah, that's going to happen too. That's okay. Okay. We have that computer dinging at us. Sorry, Bingo. So the oldest one uh, is relief printing, um, which is essentially woodcut or more recently linoleum cut, or some people will call them lino cuts. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's the one printmaking process that you uh, have to think of negatively uh, in terms of how you're putting the concepts together. Uh, it is, as I say, the oldest and the simplest. Uh, you basically take a wood plank, a nice flat one, or after about 1920, you take linoleum, which is oftentimes called battleship linoleum, which should give you a clue as to its origins. Uh, and you essentially draw the image onto the, onto the surface. And wherever you don't want it to print, you carve that away. So let's say that I drew a picture of a cat. Then I want to just have the, the cat, the pretty cute outline of my kitty show. But I want to show that it's a furry cat and it's sitting with nothing behind it. So I would have to remove all of the, the wood or the linoleum behind the cat and I would make little carving marks in little downward dashes to create the fur of the kitty. So that essentially you've, you've drawn on the image and you have to take away everything you don't want to print. Then you roll up the surface with a brayer, a, a roller with a certain kind of ink on it and the ink will adhere to all of the raised bits Right. The people why they call it relief. Yes, the stuff that stands in relief. Right. Um, and then you can print it one of two ways. One is to take a sheet of paper, lay it on the actual print, and use the what matrix. The matrix. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Neo. Sorry. Uh, it, it, uh, you you <laughs> lay the paper on the matrix, uh, and you can use a baron, which is hand printing, which I'm sure was done a long time before uh, Gutenberg and his printing press were being used. Uh, and essentially by pressing through the paper onto the, the wood, you really transfer the ink from the wood on into the paper. And I want to say into, not onto the paper. It oh. really does kind of soak in there. And you could actually, depending on how thick the paper is, <clears throat> you, can, you can actually sort of see it bloom from, um, from the back. Uh, particularly if you're printing with a nice thin Japanese kind of paper and remembering that, that the print making papers, the papers that were used oftentimes the first ones were from China and what is now Japan. Uh, Wait, but before you go further, the Baron looks kind of like a, well, it can't Okay. The ones that, that you see now, Ooh, they're like the nice Japanese ones. It's a, a literally a bamboo leaf that's then that's been wrapped around a disc, a flat disc that has a nice little flat handle on the back of it. And you just rub, 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 rub in rub, circles rub. as th- methodically as you can and very evenly all over the entire surface of the block so that it prints evenly. And uh, depending on how big the block is, this can take hours. Uh, indeed. So that three by four foot print that you used to show of mine that was yeah. at the BMA, that took about an hour and a half to just to do the baroning of it. 
Right. Just because it's an enormous amount of space and you need it to be even. And, and this little disc is no bigger than your fist, really. Indeed. Yeah. Um, now, if you were going to be doing this at home, a lot of folks will use something like a wooden, the back of a wooden spoon. Some people will use a wooden drawer pull, something that's nice and smooth and even. Um, believe it or not, for for that print I was just talking to you about, the, the big, the dead chicks, uh-huh. which I suppose you could throw that out into the ether there. You got a good picture. We can do it. I actually found a little sculpture of a cat all curled up into a little ball down in a Mennonite um, gift shop in Winston-Salem. And I picked it up and it fit the palm of my hand perfectly. It was ergonomically absolutely the size of my palm. And I literally took that silly little sculpture and I ran it across super fine grit sandpaper until it was silky smooth and even on the bottom. And that's what I used to print that print is this little sculpture because it fits my hand so perfectly. If the sculpture was a little wood? Hard yeah, wood. little 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 wooden sculpture okay. of a kitty. Um, and Harold McGrath, the guy that um, pulled prints for Leonard Baskin, those six-foot fantastic etchings, he called it his rubber. Uh, it, it was the thing that he rubbed the print with, and it rubber, was actually, uh, yeah, I, I know, I know, <laughs> not, it's like, I know, we won't go there. But he called it his rubber, uh, and it was the wooden handle of a, some printmaking tool. And you could see that over the years, he had used the side of this handle, which, you know, it was uh, about four inches long, but he had rubbed this and rubbed this and rubbed this across Leonard Baskin's enormous prints to the point that the wood had literally worn down and it was all smooth on one side and it was wildly, beautifully misshapen like well-used tools are. Um, there's a picture of it in a book and you're like, yeah, that's a guy that's for decades has used this one tool because it fits his hand perfectly to pull that. And honestly, the first time I saw uh, relief prints pulled on a, a press, I was astonished because I just always thought it was because I'd started doing them in like, I don't know, oh, when I was eight because uh, because of the, the Christmas card thing that I told you my sister had given me those relief tools. And we always had to just wipe them or rub them from behind with a baron and I don't think we even called them a baron back in those days. And and I think many of us have done relief prints. You know, if I I had asked Anne once before if her sons ever came home from school with a, a little relief print that they had made, let's say, with those styrofoam trays that you get your meat in from the grocery store. Because literally a kid can just sort of push that in with his fingertip or a, a pencil or what have you and push in the design they want and you roll up the ink on the surface of that and you'll get a wonderful, silly, nice, little, satisfying print, much like a potato print or something like that. So almost anything flat can become a relief print, and it has to be a nice flat board that's going to go all the way through a press. It has to be super nice and even. So that's the the woodcut is really the simplest way to go. They use knives or gouges or chisels, and, and when we talk about Albrecht Dürer, we're going to say that he used just a little single-edged knife to cut all of those designs because they hadn't come up with little V gouges back then, which makes it all the more astonishing. That's it's, make it astonishing. It's it's just ridiculous. So that's the the oldest and simplest of them, and it's been around since forever. I mean, they were using it to print fabrics in India and and so on and so forth, and they still do. So when when you're printing a woodcut with a press, it's it doesn't roll through a thing. It's a it's a pressure that comes straight down. Well, right? now that's a great question because. When Gutenberg was printing the Bible, it was a straight down. The, the, the Gutenberg press, uh, when they put the, the woodblock image in with all of the type, that's all what is type high, that's all the same height, they literally did use something that was based on the concept of a wine press. And it is a flat thing that comes straight down and is even with the surface. And then you pull a big lever and <laughs> it presses down as hard as it can and you lift it up. And that's one way of doing it. Now, what we do now is use a roller press. We use exactly the same kind of press that we would use for uh, intaglio, um, which we'll talk about next. But it's literally a, a roller, enormously heavy roller that will roll across the surface of whatever you're rolling through that press. And it'll it'll roll across it and your your block will go all the way through the press and come out the other side. And, and the ink is thick enough that it doesn't scudge or anything. That's right. And and ink is, is something, you know, you really have to have the right consistency for whatever task you're doing. Um, 
Some folks will um, thin their inks. Uh, There are many kinds of what we call tack reducers um, that you can spend lots of money on, or some people use a little dab of Vaseline to loosen up an ink. Depends on if you're doing battleship or not battleship. If you're doing a battlefield kind of printmaking at home or if you're in a print shop. So it, it, it needs to be just loose enough to move from the surface of the whatever you're printing onto the paper but you don't want it to be so sticky that, that it uh, pulls at the paper too hard. Uh, and you don't want it to be too loose because the oils just literally leach out into the paper. And that's really ugly. And we hate that. Um, so there's a sweet spot for every kind of ink. You know, so relief has a certain consistency that when you roll it out with a brayer, I used to tell my students that you have to hear this. Oh, yeah. It has to be even. Mm. You should never have it go. <laughs> Because that's way too much ink, and it can't sound like corduroy, like <laughs> when you're going across it. It has to be this happy, sexy, <laughs> kind of like, yeah, yeah, white noise. And when it's that way on the on the palette, and mm-hmm. then you put it on your block, when is your block ready to pull? When you can hear the <laughs> all the way across the entire block. Otherwise, your ink isn't on there evenly, and it's not going to be the right consistency to pull. So you keep using the brayer, until, or is it? When the staticky sound happens on the palette, mm-hmm. well, that that picks up the ink from the palette, right. and then you transfer that to the to the block, and and it literally rolls off of the brayer and onto the block, and you, you keep, have to you keep recharging the yeah. brayer. And the other thing that's really hard to remember is that you don't have to press; you literally just use the weight of the brayer to pick up the ink and to lay it back onto the to the block, and and it's not like you don't have to be like hard work you don't have to (laughs) yeah and and that's one of those things that i think we forget kind of like when you're carving a relief print a lot of students think that they have to dig real deep to make it's like no you don't have to remove hardly anything just enough let's say certainly no more than an eighth of an inch to distinguish the um the the down spots from the up spots to be able to print and oftentimes uh if you look at prints and you see a bunch of interesting kind of background noise in the in the what are generally the light spaces it's a residual of some of the carved marks in those negative spaces that may have picked up ink and eventually you start realizing that all of your strokes should really pay attention to the directionality of whatever that image is that you're carving because they can become a secondary player in how you create the image um, Durer, when he's carving his, it's a light switch. It's either all the way on or it's all the way off. But if you were talking about, let's say, a Jim Dine, and he's been using something like, well, in his case, he was using a chainsaw. We chainsaw, were just yeah. looking at this. <laughs> and and not all of the wood surfaces, you know, completely removed. There's still tiny bits that are still sort of sticking up. It gives this wonderful kind of noise, a visual activity um, that really adds a warmth to the print. If you, if you dig too deep, you number one, you're going to screw up your tools. Number two, you may cut yourself. Number three, why bother? You weaken the block. There's so many reasons. And, and you can slip and take out a huge chunk of it. It's, it. This is a process that requires a certain kind of relaxation, which coming from buddy, somebody who is as intense as I am, it means you have to go to this really wonderful Zen place and you have to breathe and you have to just sort of let there be the tool passing through the wood. You can't rush it. Oh, don't you dare. If you rush it, like, oh, I just want to get this done before I have to go to school. No. Not dead meat. <laughs> nope. Because it's once you've carved it away, it's gone. Right. Um, and that's just, you just have to be in the moment to carve it. That's one of the beautiful things about it. I sometimes remember in the early parts of woodcuts that you find there that the artists have left a, a board or just to, to stabilize yes and you're exactly right about that they do and that that creates that nice crisp border that's there because that that's what helps keep the brayer or and back in those days they may have even used a dabber a big it's like a big flat oh, um yeah, thing right. like bat, 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 right, right. which they would have used to ink up the the, the type Le- as leather, well leather yeah, yeah yeah it's a big blob of weather, leather and it's probably bigger than about the size of a small cantaloupe okay. with a handle on it bat, 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 bat. um and yes that that edge around it keeps the dabber or the ink from going down into the areas that it's not supposed to so it literally does it's sort of like putting a fence around your farm field. Ah. 
and yeah, it, and and you see that in jurors, and you see that in a lot of book illustrations. It makes perfect sense. But you don't see it in Baskin's nope. gigantic life-size figures. Nope. And it literally his go like right to the edge, and then they stop. Although it, on some um, pulls of like Hydrogen Man, um, there will be those big uh, empty spaces because he would use shaped plates. I'm sure of it. Oh. But you might see a spot where uh, Anzac Ann and I are both looking up at We're my looking at, at Man of Pre- uh, Man of Peace that's here in the <clears throat> print shop because reasons, and it's six feet tall. But you can actually see in some spots on some of the poles of that 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 just a little bit uh, was on the edge of the wood block that was carved away. But there's just a hint of that showing up in the in the print. And, you know, that might have been Harold McGrath doing a thing that, that maybe he, maybe Leonard Baskin said that's okay. I can see that it doesn't appear on mine. But. Right. So, and then my other question is that in other kinds of printmaking, the papers are dampened yeah. before printing. Is that the I, case in Woodcut? I've actually seen some people dampen their paper for relief printing, but I have absolutely no need to ever to do that for just a straight relief. Let's say I'm just rolling it up in black ink. If my pressure is correct on my press, there's no need whatsoever to dampen the paper. In fact, it might not be what you want at all. Although, with printmaking, every shop is different and everybody learns a different way. Some people may want to have more of a slight emboss. It it could be. And the other thing before we move on to Intaglio, um, if you ever wanted another color, it's a separate block generally. Uh, Generally, it's a completely separate block with the whatever color shape you want. Uh, and if that were the case, let's say that um, I wanted my kitty cat to be sitting um, on a chair looking out a window and the chair is red and the kitty cat is black and the window frame is brown. Um, I would have carved out a block for brown and I would have carved out all of the windows where I'm supposed to be able to see through and the, the mullions and the muntins of the windows would be the part that are up in relief. Those could get rolled in brown. And I would have created a block that is the shape of the chair that the kitty is sitting on. And I would roll that up in red. Um, and, and those generally get printed at different times. Um, and then the last thing tends to be the key block, which would be the black block uh, with the nice sharp edge that Anne was mentioning and the kitty. All, and that would go on, on top and sort of lock all of those things together. Um, how did how do you make sure that you are carving the exact same image? Like, how do you transfer the same image to the three blocks so that you're carving the same composition? Well, that's a, another really good question. Some people, <laughs> I will, try. well, I mean, that's it, well. There are several ways. And these days, you know, you could have done a transfer like you could literally do a Xerox transfer, and you there's a magic that can happen, and you literally. You know, tr- can transfer that whole image to the block. You could use tracing, Using like oil or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But more to the point, or you could, solar. you could, yeah, you could use uh, tracing paper and a piece of carbon paper between. Um, some people will actually have printed like the key block, and they'll print that on another sheet of paper, and then they'll take the, the next block that is exactly the same size and lay it on top of that proof, and roll that through the press, and and then. Instantly, you've got exactly what the the key block looks like showing up on the block that you need to carve next. Right. It's it's, making sure that you're doing it in the correct orientation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, (laughs) there are little tricks to everything. Absolutely. But it's it that, and there are even what I think are wonderful are puzzle piece kinds of prints um, Mm -hmm. where you could literally have have an image that's cut up of different pieces. Who is that? Apfelbaum? Polly Apfelbaum? Um, That each piece is a different color. And so they were all the same height, but you can ink up each one of those pieces and then push them all together. And create, together. Yeah. Oh. And it, those can be really beautiful. And then there's this other thing called a suicide print. I, know, I was hoping you were going to. Well, that. okay. So suicide. They are. And it's called a suicide print because you take the same block. Let's say my kitty cat is going to be looking out this window, but uh, the very first color is, mm, Let's say that it's a yellow wallpaper that's all the way around the kitty, and I carve away everything that needs to stay white. Let's say the window shapes, all right? And so I print, I just carve away the window shapes, and I print all of that yellow. And then the next thing I need is the brown of the windows. So I'm going to carve away everything that's not the window shape and the kitty and the chair, and I'm still using the same block. 
and I'm going to roll that up in a nice light brown ink. And then I print it exactly on top of the yellow that I already printed. So now there's an interesting secondary color that's created by the brown on top of the yellow. And yet your, your white spots are still lining up. And then let's say it's time to put on the chair. So I carve away everything except the kitty and the chair and that, that's supposed to stay brown. No, stay, stay red, right, okay? Right. And now I've got a red chair and I've got the, the border all the way around and I got the kitty, which is now going to look like it's a real interesting blend of yellow and brown and red. And the red of the chair is going to stay red. And now it's time to make my key block and I'm going to cut away everything except what's supposed to be black, which is the kitty and the, and the black edge around. Right. And and in there, you know, I get this little furry spots and what have you. And that has to get carved, you carve away everything else that's not going to be any of those colors except black. And that has to be registered perfectly on top of the yellow and the brown and the red. And sometimes it doesn't get registered perfect. So that's a dud. And so you, let's say that I start with 20 sheets of paper and I print all of the yellows first. And then I go to register the brown on it. And eh, two of them look kind of shitty. So I had to throw those out. So now I'm down to 18. And then I did the red and eh, it worked out pretty well. I only lost one of those. Okay. And so I'm down to what? 17. 17. And now it's time to put on the key block, but I'm kind of out of it that day. And I just didn't quite get it to line up. And sometimes my ink isn't going evenly on my block and I'm not really paying attention enough. And maybe I put too much oil in it because you also have to have it release enough. Some things have to have drier in it. Each of the layers of ink have to kind of, you know, be able to stand on top of each other. And, and so every time I'm printing this black, like the first four just look like ass. So now I'm down to 13 and then Okay, I'm starting to hit, oop, I slipped. Now I'm down to 12. <laughs> and so sometimes you can start with, you know, 20 sheets and you'll end up with five prints that look good. And if you don't end up with those five, that's a suicide print because then you're going to, number one, go commit suicide because you well, wasted all this time and paper on and it. And you can't go back. And you can't go back. So there's no, it literally, there's just, you, it's something you can't undo. You can't unsee something. You can't unhear the ringing of a bell. You can't <laughs> uncarve that mark. You can't unprint that messed up uh, registration. And we call that registration when you're printing one color on top of another. I, they're impressive. But my issue with suicide prints, or um, what, what are we calling them again? Reduction. Reductions. Because yeah. you're reducing the amount of, of, of surface area, is that oftentimes, unless it's a really good printer and it's not my cup of tea, so I haven't mastered this, is that the ink tends to get thicker and thicker on top of itself. And it, and it has an icky kind of a gloss to it that I just don't. I don't, for my tastes, I don't, I don't appreciate. So I'll figure out a different way to tile together those colors. I might do puzzle pieces or something like that. Um, but yeah, but there are a couple of students that have killed, made some killer really, you know, reduction prints. Um, but then that's their whole semester too. You know, oh, right. time. You know, time, 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 time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, when they're done well, well, they're amazing. Yep. It, but you, when I read something's a reduction print, or, which is usually what they're described reduction woodcut. Mm -hmm. Like it, I just sit there and I try and, figure out the different layers and how it occurred. Like it, it takes me to a different place than just well, taking the work in. Yeah. And it also then puts you in a, of a mind, if you're interested in trying to pick apart the sequence of screen printing, you can tie it. So you tend to work from lightest to darkest. So, you know, some people go, well, geez, Trude, why'd you go with the brown instead of the red next? Well, my brown was a light brown. It was a very thin brown. And my red was a punchy, nice, big, strong red. So they went in that sequence. And, and so you have to think in layers like you would with screen printing. Uh, that's why graphic design majors are always really good at things like screen printing and, and thinking of layering and color blocking because, you know, they, they've been thinking in layers all along. Or maybe anybody that works in Photoshop, which is not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so and and we'll talk about that other beautiful oddball chiaroscuro woodcuts when we got, talk about our Italian yes. and friends that are doing those in the 16th century. Right. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, a whole <laughs> other kettle of fish. That's right. Yeah, but relief printing really, by and large, is really quite simple. 
Um, and, and it can be really elegant. It can be incredibly precise or it can be really ragged and um, rough hewn like uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. You know, he, you can just see him in there like, <coughs> hacking away. And that's part of that whole uh, German expressionist ethos that wants to have the, the mark be into the wood and the, the signature of the wood may need to show. The signature would be the, the grain of the wood. So, um, style reflecting the times. Right? Yeah. So let, let's say that that's a super hard wood, then um, it's going to have a nice tight signature. You won't, may not even be able to see the wood grain. Uh, if you use something like mahogany or luan, you'll absolutely see the wood grain. If you use oak, it's going to be almost tragically obvious unless you're <laughs> planning on it, which I had a student that was doing a re- Reduct, uh, a redo of a Kate the Colvitz, and that oak showed up. Not only that, but oak is just wickedly hard to carve. So, but they didn't know any better. So we'll be kind. So the you use a birch plywood. I, I use birch plywood from Home Depot or Lowe's. Hi, give me my money now, my, my royalties. Right. Um, birch plywood that is used for um, cabinet facing. You know, for the doors of your cabinet. It's so nice and even, um, but it's a ply. Uh, so there's only one because I work enormously, you know, I, yeah, I'm sorry. There's no understating. Uh, <laughs> so if indeed there's a low spot or a hollow in some of those layers, um, that won't print properly. And that's why the, the dead chicks, that huge print I do, I have to pull by hand because if I run it through a press, there's a divot in it that I can't, I can't fix, right. which was found out by accident and under right. great duress, but it all worked <laughs> out because the other thing about using a baron is it has a, there's a human touch to it that can be used expressively because if you wanted to, you could press more in certain areas and, and, and get the ink to transfer uh, with more intensity as opposed to other areas. Some, some printmakers like the Japanese woodcut artists can use less pressure and it'll give you sort of this wonderful gradient. Um, and when you run something through a press press, it, it's even. Yeah. And that's why linoleum cut is even. It just It's a machine-made thing, and it's even. And, and wood has a, a different signature, and when you carve it, it has a completely different personality. Um, and I try to make the, the whorls in the wood actually echo what I'm carving, because sometimes they actually do show. So it's, it is what I think of as sculpture on a very level playing field, but it's still sculpting. So, and then there's a trick you do when you're trying to get the signature of the wood to show. Don't you rough it up with a wire brush or something? Some people do. I've, well, because my wood carving is super fussy, tight, 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 like almost Dura-ish in certain spots. Um, but yeah, if you want to have that wood grain show up, it's gorgeous. If you use like a steel, steel um, wire brush, chugga, 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 and you can really rough it up and you can get it. Before a, you ink it. Yeah. Right. Then you can just get really dramatic, wonderful things because only the harder grain parts of the grain will remain and you will have, you know, uh, with you would have essentially annihilated any of the spongier part of the wood, so you just get the personality, the the absolute imprint of the wood grain itself. And if you have, a, say, a nice sort of wavy, maybe even a knot, you can use that to echo your sky. The, my very your first or... wood cut in college, I had a piece of pine, and it had a knot in it, and so I used that, and it was the moon, and I you know got a, and it, it was a two two cut, yeah totally use the knots it's, you really use the wood Lots uh, of options absolutely yeah yeah i totally used that knot it was like i just thought it was being so clever well, but i had never seen anything right. you know and the first to use it that way but no hell no like I, the students that don't think they have any of the rauschenbergian sensibilities like uh yeah, yeah you right. know guess what <laughs> people have been making collages for 100 years too 120 so that's really okay good So that is all that we have to say about relief woodcutting as a good half hour there. So hopefully you learned something and can now feel confident about your ability to identify and understand how relief printmaking works. Um, stay tuned for other episodes that will cover intaglio printmaking, lithography, and also screen printing. And... Thank you for joining us. Plate Mark is produced by me, Ann Schaefer, and a special thank you to my incredible co-host, True Ludwig. No one teaches history of prints better. Also, a thank you to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. And thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time. <laughs>